everyone. Happy Wednesday. We're just admitting folks into the room. And while we're doing that, if you want to introduce yourselves in the chat, um, that would be great. And you're welcome to share your name, your organization, if you're representing an organization. Um, and, you know, if you want to share a fun advocacy update or what um, is interesting to you right now in the world of food system advocacy, please do so as well. Uh, and I'll go ahead and introduce myself. I'm Michelle Caruso. I am the manager of strategic partnerships here at the Montgomery County Food Council. Um, and these are new community calls that we just began hosting in 2023. And we're really excited to convene this group regularly to talk about what's happening in the world of food advocacy, share what actions we're taking, hear from elected officials, and hear from the food system advocacy community on um, what's going on so we can all, you know, be engaged and on the same page and share information. So thanks for being here. Um, I've got a couple updates. And maybe Jack or I, let's see, I think I can throw the agenda into the chat real quick. If I can find the chat. There it is. So hopefully the agenda is loading for you. Um, but the, a really big announcement here at the Montgomery County Food Council is that we are hiring a new executive director. So after about eight and a half years, uh, Heather Bruskin has left the organization and we truly appreciate her time and expertise. I know a lot of folks, oh, and she's on the call. Hey, Heather. <laughs> Uh, well, Heather, we really appreciate you and miss you and are happy that you're still able to engage in this work um, from the county government side. Uh, but that means that there is a vacancy um, here at the Food Council, and it's a really important time in our growth and transition, um, especially given that Heather has been the leader for eight and a half years. This is, you know, we're really excited to see what's next for the Food Council, and we hope that you will um, view the job description, share it with your networks, um, and, you know, get the word out. The first uh, review of applications is going to take place March 1st, so definitely if you could help us spread the word, we'd really appreciate it. For those of you just joining, feel free to share your name, organization, if um, you're representing one, and anything you're interested in related to the food system um, right now, like a hot topic for you, if you'd like. And then my next announcement um, is that there are just a lot of events going on um, within the Montgomery County Food Council, and we've sort of changed our structure for um, how we do convenings. And I just want to make folks aware of the events page on our website where we track um, where we're, we're tracking the upcoming events, not only that we are hosting, but also from a lot of our partners. So if you are interested in um, knowing about upcoming events related to the food system, either that we're hosting or a partner is hosting, feel free to check out the events page on our website. If you are hosting an event and you would like us to um, feature it on the events page on our website, feel free to reach out um, and we're happy to do so. And so um, without further ado, I think we are on track on time. Um, and we have Council Member Natalie Fani Gonzalez on the call. So thank you so much. Um, Council Member Fani Gonzalez is our first elected official that we've been able to host on our advocacy community calls, and we're so excited to have her. I'm just going to read a brief bio and then turn it over. Um, so Council Member Fani Gonzalez brings deep local government experience and a strong background on economic opportunity for all to the Montgomery County Council. Until August of 2021, Natalie was the vice chair of the Montgomery County Planning Board, the local agency that regulates real estate development, plans transportation infrastructure, and manages the park system. During her seven years on the planning board, Natalie was a key player in supporting the growth of the county's life sciences sector through master plans, including the Great Seneca Science Corridor, White Flint, and Bethesda. And we're just so thrilled to have Council Member Fani Gonzalez here on the call. And with that, I will turn it over to you. 
Thank you so much for the invitation. Please just call me Natalie. It's all good. Um, I love having a conversation and not just me talking. Uh, but um, so feel free to unmute and do all the good stuff. And um, I, I guess we can start talking about my district. So you have an idea of where I represent. So the new district six is the area between Forest Land and Aspen Hill. I live in Wheaton, right in the middle. Uh, we have three metro stations, uh, Forest Glen, Wheaton, and Glenmore metro stations. So think of Georgia Avenue as the spine of my district. It includes Kent Mill and also parts of North Bethesda as well. Uh, very diverse. Um, is the district that has the highest amount of Latinos as well. And I've been living here in the districts for the past almost 25 years. Um, between Aspen Hill, Kensington Heights, and, and Wheaton. In Wheaton for the last 10 years. Um, I am married. <laughs> I have two children in Montgomery County Public Schools um, in fourth and fifth grade. Very excited that my oldest is going to middle school next year. We'll see how that goes. She's going to Alyssa Shannon um, here in the Wheaton, Kensington, Wheaton, Camille area. And let's see, I am the, because of my background in parking planning, as uh, you know, each council member is in two committees within the county council. Um, and so I am a member of the planning and parks and housing committee. It's known as the PHP committee, planning, housing, and parks. And the chair of the economic development committee, which is a brand new committee, um, basically the Fed, who used to be called, uh, was split into two committees. So I'm pretty much the new Fed just because I'm the only council member in both committees. So I think that's funny if you're like in, in the, <laughs> into these things. Um, what else? Um, do you want to ask me questions so I can basically, or, or should I just continue? Well, on, I can say that on the economic development committee, uh, one of the first things that I'm looking at is uh, DPS, the Department of Permitting Services, is under my committee. So I'm looking to streamline that committee. There are a lot of issues within DPS. It's a huge animal, lots of complaints. Uh, it hasn't been modernized. Um, so I have my first session, modernizing DPS is coming up in, in March. And I've been doing uh, meetings with a new director of DPS, Randy, uh, going to different places in the county where I know businesses have struggled dealing with DPS. Um, so if you know of a place uh, that has had challenges with that particular department, please send them my way. That's a request from me to you. Um, we won't be able to change and modernize and evolve if we don't talk about the issues that this department has had. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is like, I'm very into transportation infrastructure. I run my, my race on that front and, and also housing. Tonight, actually at 6.30 PM is my very first town, town hall meeting with a community and it's on transportation infrastructure, making sure communities are safe to walk, bike, roll, take transit and drive. I will be at the Wheaton Library, 6.30. Uh, we're gonna have a strong component, component in Spanish. Um, we'll be doing a lot of advertisements. So I, I hope a lot of people come. So it's, um, although it has a strong focus on Wheaton, we're also gonna be talking about walkability in other places in my district, Forest Glen, Kensington Heights, Aspen Hill. As you may know, Georgia Avenue is one of the most deadliest streets in the county and one of the top ones in the entire state. Uh, since 2015, over 30 uh, crashes have happened in, in, in this in, on Georgia Avenue where people have either died or be seriously uh, injured. Uh, just two weeks ago, another person crossing Georgia Avenue was killed crossing the street. So it's a serious problem that requires urgency. I was able to put in the Montgomery County priority letter for transportation projects. I was able to include Georgia Avenue as on that priority letter that goes to the state. SHA is coming today and I, uh, Governor Westmore 
confirmed on Friday that he's that he accepted my invitation to come uh, for a safety walk on Georgia Avenue uh, in probably most likely May, just because I want we're waiting for the General Assembly to be done with and for the weather to be nicer. Uh, so it can walk. So I'm shooting May or late April before the rain comes back. Um, and let's see. Um, do you have any questions? I have questions, but I also um, welcome folks on the call to drop a question in the chat or raise your hand. I don't need to go first. The crowd wants you to go first. I know, I know, clearly. Um, I really appreciate uh, you mentioning the transportation issues and walkability audits and and things that need to happen. My wife used to be a middle school teacher at Loiterman in, in Aspen Hill, and I used to drop prof at work all the time and saw kids crossing the street nearby, you know, four lanes of traffic. Um, it's certainly very scary. Could you um, talk a little bit about how transportation infrastructure intersects with the food system? I think, you know, we've seen where sometimes food uh, retail outlets and food assistance providers and grocery stores aren't always considered when it comes to planning bus routes and other features within the community. So could you speak a little bit to that? Oh, they're like highly important. And I actually, that's something that I uh, had raised when I was on the planning board and have always pushed to increase the budget for all the food gardens that we have on run by parks. And I have even said that, um, that we should use uh, other public facilities, including schools, to ensure that we have more gardens, food gardens for, for, you know, for people to, to grow food. That's how I was raised. I was raised in South America. I'm the only immigrant on the county council. And to us was like, you know, something um, very common to have, um, to grow food in your backyard or even in plazas nearby. That's not, for here is so foreign. No wonder why obesity is so high in, in the United States. I mean, you think about it. And when I talk about walkability and making sure that people use uh, transit and, and we have uh, protected bikeways, it's also about making sure that we have a healthier society and that you can walk to the H Mart or to a local food bank um, instead of driving. So it's all that connected. And that, also, that is all part of economic development because when you have places where you can access healthy foods, not just food, but healthy foods, uh, you know, on, on a walking to, towards that, that's, that's a good thing. People, there have been studies where places, stores that have, um, that are walkable to get to do better because they have more customers coming in. So it's a win-win in every single way you see it. I know there is a particular uh, uh, properties owned by the park system on Georgia Avenue by the, um, uh, it's like North Forest Glant. It's called, I think it's called Carroll, Carroll Park. It's right on Georgia. It's right ac across the Evans Parkway Park, that beautiful park. It's like an empty land right there. It's huge. Perfect place to start growing some food, you know? Uh, and that's just one. And, and I feel like, especially coming from parking planning, when we always put on the budget, having more money, like staff to train, because this requires not just the land, but having people to teach others on how to grow and, and protect the place. Uh, we always will get, when our budget will come to the, when the planning board's budget will come to, I, I need to stop saying we. When the parking planning budget will come to the county council, they will always cut that because they don't prioritize that item. Um, I think it should be the opposite when we talk about uh, health, healthcare, and uh, having a strong workforce in in, in a strong um, community. Health is always is number one. Um, so, I mean, that's my long answer for a simple question that is not simple, it's very complex, but it's like really common sense. I don't even know why it's so hard to give a priority, but I'm gonna deal with my first budget. So I want to need from you is to tell me where those ideas that I just share with you are like um, itemized 
So again, pay attention. Again, it's my first budget. So don't assume that I know everything because I don't. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. And I see we have a question in the chat from Jackie DiCarlo of Mana Food Center. Jackie, do you want to come off mute and phrase your question verbally or do you want me to read it? Sure, sure. Well, hey, Natalie, I, um, as a District 6 constituent, I'm glad you're making time for the Food Council, but also Mana Food Center knows already of your interest in food security, and you just touched on it in terms of healthy eating and safe food access. Um, I know it is your first budget. However, I'm wondering, as you're getting oriented, um, what you are hearing about uh, the landscape the, um, in terms of what the county executive might be sending over and um, if uh, and I know we're going to hear update, um, you know, from uh, Annapolis through through Lorig's team, but how that working relationship is, because we are a lot about, you know, the budget surpluses at the state level, but we also know there are inflationary and revenue pressures. So what are you hearing? Can you, you know, pretend we are in the briefings you were receiving? What are the key takeaways? I haven't received any briefings from the county executive. <laughs> Well, it's not ready. My my first briefing on the operating budget, right? It's coming up in March. So very soon. March is like, I feel it's like tomorrow. It's like very, very soon. Um, so I don't know, to be honest. All I know is the CIP, you know, budget, which he already released. And we had a briefing on the budget the day he released it. And my understanding is that he's gonna be briefing us the very same day he's releasing his operating budget. So I, I have no idea. Um, I know my priorities, which are um, on the school system, making sure that, that the kids are getting healthy foods. And I don't know how that plays with you guys in the in MCPS, but also it's beyond MCPS. It is growing food. I just gave you one example of that particular parkland that will be perfect to grow. Um, and I already told uh, Mike, Mike Raleigh from the Parks Department uh, about that. I mean, that that area has to be activated. What perfect use um, in, 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 in understanding that my, I have a strong focus on, on making Georgia Avenue a corridor, a boulevard where people can walk and bike. Wouldn't it be beautiful to have some type of of growing, you know, garden right on Georgia and, and imagining that Georgia is becoming this boulevard with trees as I grew up in South America. That's how the streets were. People here are so obsessed about going fast, 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 instead of understanding that we all live in a community and we should all be protecting each other. So that's on the budget. The other thing that I, I will share with you on the budget is housing. Uh, as you know, I am submitting a housing bill on Monday, and we need money to create more deeply affordable housing, not just housing that is, yes, I mean, creating more housing, more density near the metros is a good thing for the overall market, but we also need to focus on creating deeply affordable housing. So low-income people, meaning folks who are making twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year as a family are able to stay in Montgomery County. A great example happened about a month ago on Randolph Road. There is a project with the county and a nonprofit that builds housing. The groundbreaking uh, took place about a month ago. It's on Randolph Road with Verosmith Road. It's where the old uh, rec center used to be, that property. I worked on that property in that area on the planning board when I worked on the Verosmith Court of the Master Plan, and it was a recommendation. And finally, the state and the uh, the county worked together to give us funds to make sure that that property will be deeply affordable. Another one coming up is the one the Wheaton Arts and Culture Center that the, the county executive put on his CIP budget. It's going to be uh, next to the Ava building on Georgia Avenue, like a block away from the Wheaton Library. So it's, it's creating deeply affordable housing with an arts center, with which will have an auditorium that sits about... Uh, 800 people plus workspace for artists. And that's the part of workforce development and making sure that our low-income children and youth could be exposed to something like this. Uh, Wheaton is an arts and entertainment designated area by the state. So it's a great thing that that's happening. Um, and we can see the first meeting on that particular project is on March 7. There's always opportunities. They're gonna have a garden there. Maybe it shouldn't be a garden with flowers. Maybe it should be a garden with tomatoes and I don't know, 
a green, what's it called that? The green, green greenhouse. House. Greenhouse, there you go. Ah! I'm so tired, guys. I've been up <laughs> since seven in different meetings back to back and I have this town hall tonight. I won't get to it until probably 1 a.m. And I have another meeting at seven tomorrow. Anyway, too much for you. Um, but uh, I mean, so many possibilities. So the first committee meeting for that particular project is March 7, virtually. If you follow me on Twitter and social media, you'll see the invite. You can just click on that one. Uh, so yeah, Jackie, that's what I have. <laughs> if you talk to me after March 15, then I can give you another answer after I hear the briefing from the executive. So I'm seeing two questions about gardening in the chat so i'm going to try to combine them for uh for time um are there permitting issues or problems when it comes to increasing the number of community gardens and then if someone knew of land that that was desired to be a community garden how would um, someone go about taking the steps to make that happen i'm going to answer the second one first the second one is who owns the land that's the first question. Is it privately owned? Is it owned by a trust? In the case that I gave you as an example, is owned by the government to the parks department. So uh, it's easy for me to say, we should do this because we already own it. Well, NC, the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission owns it, but um, we have a say if we put the money so they can do the work, meaning put the money in the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission budget so they can do that work and they have my support on that one and again I talked to Mike Riley literally yesterday about this um so so that's the first question in in terms of DPS actually the it will be zoning first if it's a property that where that is located in a place where you can actually grow things I don't think it will be a big problem when you are like growing vegetables in, especially in a residential area, think about schools. I mean, they're the target. They have so much land. Honestly, we should be looking at schools and parkland because if you go outside those two, it's just way too expensive, especially if you're thinking about urban farming, which I think should be the goal. And I'm not even talking about cannabis yet. You know, that's coming, you know, growing Mary Jane. <laughs> um, so that's gonna be happening. And I cannot wait for the General Assembly to finish uh, with the regulations, how that's gonna look like. I know I'm gonna have a session in my committee as part of economic development and cannabis. I know that you're not talking about cannabis and food, but anyway, came to mind because it is literally growing something. Um, but so so the question is on zoning. And then after you check the zoning and see who owns the land, then you, you look at DPS. Um, and see if there are any issues there. Um, so. Thank you. Yeah, and I think you bring up a good point about cannabis and competition for land when it comes to growing food. I think that's something certainly to be looking out. Oh, it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Cannabis versus tomatoes. I can see it. <laughs> so I see a hand raised. Marla, I saw your hand, but then you put it down. Did you I, have a question? I, no, I was going to um, comment and kind of add to what Natalie is um, sharing about gardens, and certainly can I can address the schools. Um, first of all, Natalie, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, congratulations as a new council member, and I'm sure everybody on this call is looking forward to working with you. Um, just a little bit of history. Um, I am a retiree of MCPS. And one of the issues about gardens and schools, and, and they do have them, and actually Michelle can speak personally about the garden at Loiterman Middle School. Um, they do have them. The issue is maintenance. Right. Um, and, and that is a problem. Um, and so that has to be kind of figured into the equation um, because if you don't maintain it, I don't need to tell you this, you're going to have all kinds of problems. Yes. Yeah. The same situation happened in Ken Mill. My kids went to Ken Mill Elementary School. We had a garden there, but no men power or women power. Can I say women power? Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, that's why I'm saying that it needs to be part of the budget. Uh, I mean, even the ones that we have with the park system, it's staff who takes care of them. Right. It's not simple. My my family, my mom and my dad, they both both grew up in farms. 
So I did not. I was born in Caracas in a big city. It's like 8 million people. But they did, so they will tell me. And uh, it's not easy work. So... Well, and, and just to add to what you're saying, Natalie, the, the other reason, um, and, and it comes from the experience that I've had in the school system, is so many of our students come from backgrounds that have an agricultural um, flair to them, just as you do. And what a great way of celebrating their cultures and bringing them into the farming. Yes, I agree with you. Plus, it's so therapeutic. Honestly, it is. Yeah. And the food tastes better. Um, I'm going to address a comment in the chat about how Upper Montgomery County has the worst cycling infrastructure and Bruce agrees with the need to support community gardens. So thank you, Bruce, for those comments. And then I'm going to Christina and then we have a couple other um, questions in the chat. So Christina. Thank you so much, uh, Natalie, for being here. Hello from the Agricultural Reserve. I'm Christina Bostic. I'm with Montgomery Countryside Alliance, and we uh, are the small but mighty organization protecting the agricultural reserve. Um, I am thrilled to be uh, the director of our land link program. We're matching uh, new and expanding farmers with local landowners offering, offering long-term leases. I, I'm just so excited for what you've identified in terms of the acreage needed for small scale gardens, small scale farms, and that it needs to be, um, you know, just really taking off. I just, I wanted to share that we've had just since the year began, seven different new farmers come into our program from all over the world, immigrants from nice. all over, each of them with, you know, a decade of experience, each in farming, all of them interested in growing the culturally appropriate food that our food banks and food relief organizations are clamoring for, the problem is land. And so many of these farmers are, are seeking what I think we could give them in like a formal incubator program. Um, for us, our organization, we've been um, looking at eco city farms over in PG County. Um, and we'd love to recreate that, but I just wondered if you could speak to, similar to the maintenance issue of of school gardens, um, it's just going to take so many different departments working together. It's going to take so much funding over the long term to make it sustainable and something that can churn out those new farmers that we know we need. And so I'm just, I'm wondering, do you have an idea of how this great group of folks makes that happen? You know, let's do something because I don't, I'm not going to pretend to know the answer of that. I'm more of a housing land use, but in terms of urban density. So why don't we do this? Um, Agro-tourism is all under my committee on economic development. Uh, land use in the agro reserve is under the PHP committee, which is the planning house and the parks committee, which I am also a member. For your question, if I frame it as Part of agro-tourism, making sure that we are supporting farmers and, and building, because that's also part of tourism, right? I go to the to the up, up county to pick up, you know, pumpkins and to pick your own farms and all that good stuff. Like I can, if I frame it like that, we can have a work session in my committee to talk about how can we as a county support this industry and the farmers even more what's out there in the county. I don't even know, again, I knew, I don't even know if Olo, Olo is the over the Office of Legislative Oversight for the county, it's O-L-O, -O, but I, it's easier for me to say Olo. Um, have done any research on this? Do you know if, if, cause if they haven't, that could be probably my, my first step and see how has it been, you mentioned Prince George's County, how, this works in other parts of the county, how our county is probably failing. I don't want to say failing, but not up to date on, on this. Um, so number one, I'm going to follow up with Olo and see if they have done anything on this. If the answer is no, or even yes, have like a, a committee session on food production in terms of the economy, because I need to frame it as part of my committee and, and, and use the... The uh, the umbrella that I have on the agrotourism, 
And then I will need you to help me identify who are the speakers. Um, we need like people who maybe somebody from Prince George's County, maybe not, it's not Prince George's County, maybe it's another place that can share with us their expertise. Um, that we can work. And I'm happy to follow up with maybe Michelle. Um, we I can follow up with you to to see to so that is like one thing we can get out of this meeting. Every time I meet with people, guys. I don't just want to talk. I need to get something out of it because otherwise it's like a waste of time. <laughs> so maybe that's the one thing that we can get besides the budget, right? That's something else. Um, but that could be like the one thing I can get out of this. And I see somebody, Vicky, has her hand up. Maybe she has the answer to all this and we don't need the committee session. <laughs> Vicky, you want to go ahead? Yeah, thank you so much. Can y'all hear me okay? Okay, awesome. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for your time, Natalie. It's really exciting to chat with you. As I heard you saying some of the challenges, especially with the budget around training and staff, and then I forget who mentioned that the schools right now with gardens, maintenance is an issue as well. Um, selfishly, as an entrepreneur who is in this space looking to accelerate urban agriculture, um, it's been challenging to find out how best to partner with and connect with Montgomery County Council in particular. I know Maryland has a lot of grants. I know sometimes Montgomery County has some grants, but for entrepreneurs who are really looking to do kind of more innovative, not just nonprofit, not fully grant driven um, kind of ways to accelerate uh, solutions to this problem, it's very hard to know where to start or who to connect to. So do you have any suggestions? Because I feel like we have really great entrepreneurs here in the county who are just kind of gunning to get started but just don't know where or how to start let's do two things i think the work session that i'm thinking we should be having will answer that or we'll talk about exactly your experience but i also don't want to wait can you uh, i'm gonna put my email in the chat vicky can you email me with your info and then let me put my email for quick. um Oh, what's my name? Montgomery County MD. Such a long email. That's my email. Um, just email me and then I'll follow up with the executive's office. Um, because they do deal directly with uh, entrepreneurs. And let me see what is there to help you. And uh, and I won't forget, just just email me and I'll follow up. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. We'll do. I know that we are at time, but I see Heather's hand is up. Natalie, do you have time for one last question? Yes. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, it's so nice to see you. And this is my first time engaging with everyone in my new capacity in my in my new office. But I just wanted to echo that, at least from my role with uh, within the county executive's office, I know there's a lot of enthusiasm and excitement for expanding opportunities um, uh, that and working with council in, in this work, um, particularly related to urban agriculture and creating opportunities for food production throughout the county. Certainly a focus on the ag reserve is important, but we can grow food um, throughout our entire county. Um, and so I think the urban agriculture tax credit in particular might benefit from council analysis to see how we can make it more accessible to a broader community um, and better emphasize the impact of, of that legislation. Now you got to tell me, where do you work now? Because do you switch jobs? What's going on here? I did. I did. So, um, yes. Yeah, so, so just, um, I guess, formally introducing myself to the folks who um, I haven't had the chance to meet before or share my news with. Um, but um, I am now the director of the Office of Food System Resilience. Um, so I'm sitting across the street um, from you. So you're going to be part of my committee session. <laughs> I, I very much hope I very much hope that I will. Yeah. So, so oh, that's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. So, so we will be um, working with the new, um, also created in the same legislation as the office, was a position within the Office of Agriculture specifically on increasing local food production. So I think there's- so you, you can talk to Vicky, because I was going to call the kind of executive, and now I'm thinking they will probably direct me to you. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably what would happen. So we can- Vicky, let me introduce you to Heather. Heather, this is Vicky. Exchange yeah. emails. 
There we go. Uh, and done. Uh, so, and, and yes, as Michelle said, that does mean that there is an opening for an executive director at the Food Council. And I'm literally on my sixth day, I think. So, um, so please, everybody bear with me. But, um, but I think there's a lot of exciting things to, to happen. And I appreciate the Food Council creating space to facilitate that conversation. All right, I'll follow up then. I, Michelle, is there any other questions you have? No? I know we're over time. So I just want to thank you so much for the time. And you mentioned how busy you are. We know how busy you are. And we really appreciate you engaging with our community and answering questions about these important issues. So thank you so much. Thank you, guys. And if you are leaving Wheaton or in my district, please come tonight, 6.30 p.m., Wheaton Library. I need folks to be there pushing hard for pedestrian safety and uh, because it's good for people and it, it's, it makes our communities healthy. Okay, so thank you so much. See ya. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, and I know we didn't get to everyone's questions, and this is why I offered not to go first. So I just want to call that out for next time, that there's an opportunity to ask, um, have your questions ready, and I, I don't have to get to mine. Um, but I'm really excited now to turn it over um, to the team of Delegate Lorg Sharkudian for some updates from Annapolis. Today is an incredibly busy day, in particular in Annapolis with the Universal School Meal Meals Bill, literally in a hearing in both the House and the Senate at this exact moment. Um, and so we're really excited about that and some other food-related bills going through the session. And we really thank um, uh, Lord Delegate Sharkudi and staff for their time. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Brittany and uh, kind of like Natalie said, I'm a mom, I have three little kids, but my other role is working together with Delegate Sharkudian as her legislative aide. And I'm really delighted to see some familiar faces on this call today um, and have an opportunity to dialogue um, and catch everyone up with what's going on in the office. So just in case you don't know, Delegate Sharkudian, she represents District 20, which is Montgomery County. And really her ambition with everything she does is to create a more just and inclusive society. And so as some of you may know, she's a tremendous supporter of the M Montgomery County Food Council. She's on the board of the Crossroads Food Network. She has a deep passion for local food, also highlighting the climate crisis and finding ways to build resiliency in our community. And so some of the bills this year, which are topics that she usually touches on, but you see it again this year, bills around energy, some related to housing, um, food, public safety and pedestrian safety. And right now she couldn't be with us today because she's actually on the Economic Matters Committee. And right now they're in a hearing listening to some, some bills. And so I know one thing we wanted to talk about today is a little bit on why it's important to advocate and then I'll also take a moment, Tyranny and I, um, I'll, Tyranny can introduce herself and we'll explain some of the bills that are going through, just in case you're not so aware of them. And so just to give a quick um, spiel on why it's important to advocate, you know, it's really difficult, um, like Natalie was saying, for one person to keep tabs on all the issues. And so really, it's, it's funny because working as her legislative aide, on one hand, you would think she gets more emails. And on the other hand, she gets a lot of emails, like it's a fine line. And so hearing individual voices helps us to know which topics matter. And in particular to implementation, how um, bills can be rolled out and how that will affect everyday people. And so hearing voices really helps us to Focus in on what's important, which is the equity, the empowerment, and the accessibility. Because just like we were talking about, if we create grants through, um, you know, by passing bills, but no one knows how to access the grant, well, now the grant doesn't matter. Or if we're uh, passing bills that allow schools to have community gardens, but we don't also increase the budget so they can hire somebody to maintain the garden, then it doesn't matter equally. And so um, to go over some of the bills, I'm going to let Tyranny start off, and she's going to um, summarize two of the bills that are actually still in committee right now, 
Uh, some of them were finalizing amendments. And then I'll explain two, two of the other bills that are going through, and then we'll open up for questions. Hi, y'all. I'm Tierney Costa. I am Delegate Charcutian's legislative intern for this session. It's my first session with her. I'm learning a lot. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so the first bill that I'm going to talk to you all about is House Bill 32, which is the Maryland Food System Resiliency Council, making that permanent. Um, this bill will make the Food System Resiliency Council a permanent entity within the Maryland Department of Emergency Management. So the FSRC addresses emergency food security issues with the goal of building a just and sustainable food system. So FSRC was started in 2021 amidst um, COVID. Uh, because we saw a real need for someone to be um, really looking after the issues of um, our food systems and food insecurity. Uh, and as a response to this going so well, we are looking to make this a permanent entity within um, Maryland. And the second bill that I'm going to um, summarize for you today is our House Bill uh, 63, which is the Chesapeake Invasive Species bill, which is um, incentivizing removal of invasive species while also building a market for them. Uh, this bill will allow blue catfish and other delicious and nutritious uh, invasive species that are caught in the Chesapeake Bay um, to count towards the goal of Maryland run institutions procuring 20% of their food from local farms and fisheries. So while doing great work of getting these invasives out of the bay, we're also getting them to Maryland run facilities um, for people that need good food. So nothing is going to waste and we're making our environments better. Um, and this bill expands the existing local farm enterprise program to include the um, invasive species. So um, that includes blue catfish, snakeheads, and some other invasives as well. Thank you, Tierney. And then two other bills we wanted to brief you guys on are, um, so it started off as one bill uh, around categorical eligibility, but it's branched out into two bills, HB 111 and 323. And so essentially what the, this bill does is it helps um, low-income families and households access all of the benefits that they're already um, required or they, they, they should be benefiting from all the programs. Or so what we're seeing in the, in the data is a lot of people sign up for SNAP. And fortunately, they are getting that food nutrition assistance, but they're not signing up in equal rates for Medicaid and they're not signing up at equal rates for um, energy assistance. So whether that's LIHEAP or some of the other programs that we have through the state. And so categorical eligibility bill will allow people to sign up with in one place and then you're automatically enrolled into the other programs. And then the last bill we wanted to discuss with you all is HB 62, which is the pollinator friendly vegetation management. So essentially this is enabling legislation that allows um, in corridors underneath power lines that the utility companies can evade the weed ordinances so that they can allow those areas to flourish as um, pollinator friendly zones. And so that's an overview of, you know, some of the bills that are on the food council advocacy list. And I'm happy to, Tyranny and I are happy to field any questions you all have. Thanks, Brittany and Tierney. I see one question in the chat from Brenna. Does categorical eligibility also mean categorical ineligibility? Can you address that a little bit, Brittany? That's a great question. And well, so the, the bill is not changing the standard for any of the, any of the um, assistance programs. So if you're currently not eligible, then you know that's just, that's kind of black and white there. And so it's not like if somebody tries to apply for SNAP, oh, they're going to get blocked out of the other programs. But it is the case that if your income is too high to apply for one, you're likely not able to apply for the other ones because the, the requirements are so similar. But, you know, the question makes me think of one of the things we're really excited about because often what happens is because these programs have multiple applications that also have to be filed every year, people 
are eligible, but they're not applying. And that's what we're seeing way more often than, you know, oh, they're eligible for this and not eligible for something else. Thank you. And I see a question from Bruce. Yes, uh, I love the idea that you mentioned with the uh, growing for pollinators under the power lines. I want to add one, one suggestion. I haven't seen a bill to cover this. Why is it that Maryland has an official state invasive plants list, but I can buy plants on that list in local plant nurseries or online for delivery to, um, to Maryland? Seems like we should stop making the hole deeper by, uh, you know, almost encouraging uh, the planting of invasive plants in Maryland. I think I actually can um, answer that one. Um, so I'm currently studying horticulture and sustainable agribusiness at Montgomery Community College here in Montgomery County. Um, and we brought this up to our professors quite a bit, actually. We couldn't understand why that is. Um, so one of the bills that we are not working on specifically, um, but we are in um, support of, Delegate Foley, also from Montgomery County, um, she is working on invasives with um, running bamboo, specifically bamboos that are not native that do a lot of damage to our ecosystems and spread very um, quickly, considered to be a tier one or should be considered a tier one invasive plant in Maryland. Um, those are, I have also not seen a bill for um, directly stopping the sales of these invasive species in department stores it would need to be something brought and a new bill brought. I know that other states have done it for certain invasive species. I think uh, regarding the Chesapeake Bay and our just wonderful ecosystems here, they really need that type of bill to be passed, absolutely. But there's none that I know of right now where they're banning the sales of those plants, but definitely something that needs to be um, advocated for, 100%. Thank you, thank you for that. I mean, it, to me, it's just, it just it boggles the mind. Me too. Right? I don't, we're, gonna pay, we're paying good. money to take it out, but we're still allowing it to be sold. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. Great question. Thanks, Bruce. Um, Tierney, I didn't, I'm surprised you didn't update us on Delegate Charcutian's TikTok and oh. uh, the amazing work that Michael J. Wilson and I did uh, to promote the Food System Resiliency Council. They did, Misha and Michael J. If anyone's interested in following along, um, I have I do most of the social media regarding TikTok for Delegate Charcutian's office, and we are really looking to um, connect with voters and constituents in this way. Um, and yes, they, Michelle and Michael J did fabulous appearances for the Food Resiliency Council for us. Um, and so if you're interested in that video, I can drop her username. If anyone's interested, please follow, send your questions, start discourse. We want to hear it all. We really do. We want to hear from you. Thank you. Brittany, anything to add before we uh, move on to the next item in the agenda? No, I, I just dropped um, Delegate Sharkudian's email in the chat, though, because she really is um ambitious and open to ideas and she never stops working so as soon as the last day of session happens she's going to be ready to start thinking of next year's bills and so if you have any ideas feel free to send them her way yes that, especially the um the invasive species one i think that would definitely be something that might catch her interest and if you don't i might so i'm <laughs> looking forward to working on that with you Thank you both so much for taking the time. I know, like I mentioned, it's a really busy week in session. Um, and so we really appreciate that you came and were able to update us. Uh, Jack, I think I'm turning it over to you. Jack from the Food Council team is gonna update the group on our legislative actions that we've been taking throughout this session. Thanks so much, Jack. Yep, of course. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, just to quickly introduce myself, I'm Jack Ewart. I'm um, a policy and outreach contractor with the um, Montgomery County Food Council. I also am a food and agricultural policy master's student at American University, um, finishing in May, thankfully. And um, really, really excited that I'm now in this field, um, which means so much to me. Um, I'm also a native of this area. I grew up in Washington, DC. So it's all very relevant. Um, and I just love being able to work with um, people who are on this call and people in this community and making a real difference. Um, I wanted to, I'm gonna share my screen really quickly um and then it's going to be all weird because 
one second while I get that to go away. I just wanted to point out our public policy tracker, which Michelle and I are updating every day at the moment, as it says error. I will go to our private policy tracker. One second. So this is what our private policy tracker looks like, but it reflects out onto our public policy tracker, which we'll, we'll fix as soon as this ends. Um, and it is really, really useful for us. This is obviously the internal looking version, but it, it reflects out the same way. It's really useful for us in terms of um, these busy times of legislation, um, just keeping track of what's going on in dates like that. Um, so you can go into the tracker and click on bill numbers to, um, to track them. You can see who sponsored it. You'll get a brief synopsis. And then for bills that we are actively you know, watching and paying attention to, our written testimony will be listed at the end. So, so far in, the, um, in this um, legislative session, we have already submitted written testimony on, I believe, seven bills. We are submitting testimony on three or four more this week. So it's been a really, really busy time, but it's been really, really awesome to let our voice be heard across the county. Michelle also had the opportunity to go testify in person. I believe April 1st was, or February 1st, excuse me. Um, right at the beginning of this month, Michelle was in Annapolis testifying for the um, Food System Resiliency Council. I assume that's when she made her TikTok, um, which I have not seen, and I'm now looking forward to watching. Um, and yeah, so I just wanted to point out this tool. It is being updated every day, so it can sometimes look a little messy or be a day behind, but it is really useful, and it allows you to also track when upcoming dates are for any advocacy you've been in, you might be interested in and anything like that. And if there are ever any questions or interest in advocating or looking at our testimony for um, guidance and any testimony, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll make sure to put my email in the chat as well. Um, our goal with this public policy tracker is so everyone knows what we are doing. We wanna be as transparent as possible in our work. Um, our work we think is very, very important to the county and makes a real difference but we want people to understand what we're doing and be able to weigh in with their voice as well, because all of our voices as council member Fani Gonzalez talked about and delegate Charcutian's staff talked about, all of our voices really matter in this work. So we are working to make sure everyone can see what is going on in an attempt to have their voice be heard. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I am going to pass it over really quickly to a, our colleague, Elizabeth, who is going to give a SNAP update. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jack. Um, yeah, just sort of a quick update on SNAP activity. I know we've all heard about a lot of things happening with SNAP in the news, and there's certainly a lot of activity um, going on at Annapolis. In addition to the um, categorical eligibility bill, we have submitted testimony on um, bills dealing with um, uh, fraud, have we done that? <laughs> yeah, the fraud. <laughs> sorry, trying to keep it all straight. Um, bills that are, are, are key towards helping uh, recoup um, SNAP benefits that have been lost to scamming and phishing um, schemes. Um, as well, there is legislation out to help college students uh, maintain some of the benefits that they were able to access during COVID. So a lot of um, trying to keep our um, our residents who need the support on SNAP. Um, I just wanted to bring a little bit of sort of um, on the on the ground sort of um, experience to all of this. We've been hearing from so many people who are truly uh, impacted by the emergency allotments going away, and just to sort of tie it in and give you a sense of the magnitude of the issue, I spoke with one elderly couple. The um, the wife had just experienced a stroke. They're sort of housebound. Um, they both earned social security and during COVID they were getting $516 a month to help them out with their um, groceries. And because emergency allotments are going away, that amount is going to be $40. Um, 
the amount of money you get for SNAP is based on your household income, not on the number of people in your household. So we've seen instances of a family of four. They were getting $939 a month and their benefit is now 60. This is a drastic drop. And I think um, there is still a lot of work to be done to help these folks. So it just sort of paints a picture of the reality here. We hear um, stories of people going into um, the local DHS offices and there are just tears everywhere. People are just sort of panicked. So we wanted to sort of bring home um, you know, some of the reality of what folks are facing. So to the extent we can, um, you know, at least make these, uh, these benefits available to more people, we're going to be seeing additional um, restrictions coming down the pike when the public health emergency is lifted. So um, adults who do not have dependents are going to be required to um, fulfill work requirements. They will only allow, be allowed to have SNAP for three months. Otherwise, these are you know, additional folks who still need assistance who are going to be impacted by these changes coming off of COVID. So it's um, an evergreen issue and something that is in constant need of support. We're, we're truly grateful for the efforts going on now. Um, to support SNAP, but there's still more work to be done in the coming sessions as well. So keep an eye out. Thanks, Elizabeth. I wasn't sure if Jack was gonna add anything else. Um, I, you bring up a great point also thinking about the Farm Bill, the 2023 Farm Bill and its impacts on SNAP and an opportunity for advocacy at the federal level to improve the SNAP environment. So thank you. Um, I just have two more quick announcements and then I will open the floor to anyone else. Um, and you're also welcome to drop your announcements in the chat and we will include them in the notes. Uh, we are going to go on a site visit. So the Food Council has four policy priorities. One of them is SNAP. We have two, uh, one policy priority related to um, local procurement. And that group is going to be going on a field trip in March. The date and time are to be determined. The location will be Mary Land's Farm, which is the farm that MCPS is sourcing produce from this spring. So we're going to travel there with Sean Sacco, our food council council member, and a member of the um, Department of Food and Nutrition Services at MCPS to talk to the farmer about sourcing um, to MCPS. And so if you want to follow along with that, um, feel free to send me an email. I'll make sure you're in the loop if you're not already, and it should pop up on our events page at some point. And then we're also launching our second working group that is focusing on a policy priority this year, which is called the Equitable and Affordable Land Access for Food Production Group. Uh, because we can't think of short names for some reason within the Food Council. Uh, and that will be launching um, on March 7th and should be on our events page as well. So you can access the registration link there. Does anyone have any updates they would like to share with the final couple minutes? Feel free to just come off mute. All right, that was my six seconds. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Um, we'll see you again next month, hopefully. Um, and as you'll see on the agenda, we have a link to a Google form that you can fill out to let us know what you'd like to hear from these calls this year. This, like I mentioned, this is a new convening. Um, and so we wanna know what this group is interested in. So thanks so much for your time today and we'll hopefully see you next month, if not before. Bye everyone. You guys. Thank you very much, Michelle. Bye everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming. It was great to see you on Zoom. I know not on TikTok this time, but next time. <laughs>